Some people think the word engineer is overused. We often call technicians engineers, the distinction being, supposedly, that a technician assembles and repairs things, while an engineer designs new things. I've been referred to as an engineer, software engineer, hardware engineer, electrical engineer, and none of these terms are wrong, but I never really think of myself as an engineer. The way I'd like to be referred to is as an inventor. Now, aside from the Wallace and Gromit connotations, not necessarily a bad thing. If you introduce yourself as an inventor, people always ask, what have you invented? Sure, my business card that's a stylophone, world's smallest synthesizer, nothing I've invented yet. It's going to change the world for the better. But I think a big part about being an inventor is preparation and practice, honing your skills so that when the really great ideas come to you, you have a means to make them happen. Because ideas are worthless if you can't turn them into reality. Now, I don't know if in this day and age it's even possible for an individual to come up with a really great invention. Every leap forwards is corporations, institutions, with a budget and resources that I can only dream of. But that doesn't mean I'm not going to try. And while I dream of great inventions, I find it's hard not to reflect back on the all-time greatest inventions. In fact, it's a question I often ask of other engineers. What is your favourite invention? What do you personally consider to be the greatest invention of all time? You could argue, quite rightly, that uh, agriculture or writing are great inventions. But what I'm really getting at are technological inventions of the last few hundred years. There are a lot of excellent candidates. It could be as broad as the internet or digital computers, or as specific as the sewing machine, the jet engine, the transistor, or Maudsley's screw cutting lathe, an excellent invention. But right now, because it's so hard to choose one, I'm going to list my top three favourite inventions. Three things that I personally consider currently to be the greatest inventions of all time. In third place, I'm going to put the bicycle. An ordinary diamond-framed pedal bike. As an invention, it's pretty much perfect. There's a reason the design hasn't really changed in over a hundred years. I mean, sure, there's folding bikes, fancy gearing systems, but fundamentally, as a concept, the bicycle is impossible to improve upon. They're very cheap, they're very reliable, they're very simple, which on a list of greatest inventions could be seen as both a positive and a negative, but the simplicity of a bicycle is the result of optimization. The thing that sticks with me is that a bicycle makes a person more efficient. If someone on foot can travel a certain distance or a certain speed, if you put them on a bike, they can go faster and further. Something I love to think about is that if a bicycle lets a person travel as fast as a horse can gallop, then how fast could a horse go if it was riding a bicycle? It might be difficult to train a horse to ride a bicycle, but with four legs, it would be able to ride a tandem. So, greatest inventions. Um, in second place, I'm going to put the Linotype. Complements the bicycle quite well, because everyone knows about bicycles. Not everyone knows about Linotypes. Bicycles are mechanically simple, Linotypes are mechanical marvels. I'm always pleased to meet someone who's never heard of a linotype because then I have the honour of explaining to them what a marvellous machine it is. For context, in the 19th century, all printing was done by hand-set movable type. Every book publisher and every newspaper relied on teams of people to set the type. The process involved picking up individual letters carved into the end of little bits of metal and arranging them upside down back to front so that eventually you can cover it in ink, press your paper against it, and the text is printed. Of course afterwards, you then had to manually sort the pieces back into the boxes they came from, which was an incredibly tedious process. The amount of human labour expended on manual typesetting is bonkers to think about. Newspapers would have teams of people working like crazy overnight in order to publish the morning's paper. Surely a machine could automate this. 
Well, no, that would be too difficult. Instead, we've got a machine that does something far more complicated. Hot metal typesetting. Instead of arranging letters we want to print, we arrange matrices, or moulds of the letters, and using a molten lead alloy, we injection mould the line of type. The Linotype machine has a magazine of these matrices, and when you type at its keyboard, these matrices fall into position. The line is cast, trimmed, ejected, and then the matrices are carried to the top, where magically they get sorted back into the magazine. There are so many bits to love about this ridiculous machine, like the little arms that carry the matrices around, the way the timing is controlled as they drop from the magazine, the way the space bars adjust so as to justify the text, the way the sorting is done, the ability to change fonts by cycling magazines, the fact that, of course, everything is synchronised from a huge series of cams at the back. There's a feeling I get when I look at it that the inventor, Otto Mergenthaler, lived and breathed mechanisms, and every problem encountered, every new feature and every bug fix could be implemented with more mechanisms. It's nuts to think that this system worked at all, but it didn't just work, it was the dominant printing method for almost a hundred years. Linotypes were invented in the 1880s, and were still being used in the 1980s. I could go on, but if you want to learn more, I can heartily recommend a 1960s documentary film called Typesetting Linotype, a superb half hour that you will not regret watching. And also, Farewell Etwin Schrödli which is about the last linotype run of the New York Times. Nothing will quell my enthusiasm for this machine. So, bicycles, the linotype, but my number one favourite invention has to be cameras. And by extension, I suppose that includes film, cinema, television, even smartphones, anything that has or uses or relates to a camera in some way. I suppose it's a bit of a cop-out, but anyone who's met me in real life can attest that I am a photography nut. I love cameras. To appreciate them, it helps to understand them. And the engineering behind cameras covers so many separate disciplines. There's optics, of course, the physics of lenses and forming an image, of flint glass and achromatic doublets and anti-reflective coatings and aspherical grindings. Then there's the mechanical engineering of shutters and moving mirrors and adjustable apertures. Some cameras have mechanisms that surpass mechanical watches in terms of complexity. Then there's electronics, the metering and exposure, the melding of electromechanics, particularly in modern zoom focus and shutter systems. There's chemistry, if we're talking film, or if we're digital, then there's DSP. There's software. Modern cameras favour lenses not with low distortion, but predictable distortion, because if it's predictable, you can correct for it. The impact of photography on human history is unfathomable. But we all know that's got nothing to do with why I like cameras. It's simply that they are a joy to use. One of my favourite cameras is the Nikon F3. And I might do a follow-up video where I'll explain how it works and why I like it so much. But to conclude this video, I'd just like to sing the praises of the Science Museum in London. There's a certain room there called Making the Modern World, and if you are as fanatical about invention as I am, this room is heavenly. Right in the middle there is the very first lock-stitch sewing machine, built by Elias Howe, there is another excellent museum in London called the Sewing Machine Museum, and it is well worth a visit. They even have an example of Thermonia's sewing machine, which is much earlier, but it was a chain stitch machine and wasn't very good. This is the machine that made sewing machines good. If you want to learn more, I strongly recommend Tim Hunkins' The Secret Life of the Sewing Machine. The Science Museum also have Maudsley's Screw Cutting Lathe and the Screw Originating Apparatus. They say the lathe is the only tool that can build a copy of itself. In fact, I don't think it's a stretch to argue that every single metal lathe was built using another lathe. So in addition to being the conceptual parent to every lathe, this machine might also be the literal parent to every lathe. If you're interested in machine tools, there's a book called Tools for the Job by Rolt, which I personally found 
absolutely fascinating. They have the prototype induction motor built by the hands of Nikola Tesla. At the time, everyone thought it was impossible, and whether or not you believe the stories of how he came up with the idea of the rotating magnetic field, the importance of this invention cannot be overstated. There's also more than one prototype jet engine, including the earliest types where the airflow does a kind of zigzag. There's this really weird promotional film where Frank Whittle appears as himself and reenacts the conception of the jet engine. It's on YouTube and worth a watch just for how bizarre it is. These few examples are only scratching the surface and no doubt next time I visit it'll all have been replaced with flashy interactive things instead. I understand the modern exhibits are great at getting kids interested in science, but I'm still bitter they got rid of the model engines and the model ships. Anyway, that concludes this small fraction of my feelings on invention.